<laughs> uh, I forgot the old technical portion of it here. All right. Uh, so if you didn't hear me out there in TV land, I was saying God bless you all in the name of Jesus Christ, and that's a big deal. I like to say that because uh, God is at the pinnacle of our lives. And uh, we've been through uh, a lot of great material so far uh, with Exodus. It's a, it's a great story, and it's carried through the whole Bible, and um, it's referenced in several different places, and uh, it's a paradigm of uh, escape for us even today. And um, in the past, I've looked at it as, you know, uh, all those elements leading up to where they got out is like the high point of Exodus, but really... Uh, today, uh, uh, maybe I'm biased because I get to teach it and I'm thankful to do it. I think that this is really the culminating, you know, uh, pinnacle of this whole story um, because we're going to be looking at called and commissioned today. And you're going to see more, and I hope I can make it live as big as it is because it's really uh, tremendous. Um, so let's look at Exodus 19, and we're going to uh, I'm going to summarize some things as I go, and and kind of like put it together in a story form, and read some verses with you. But we'll start out in 19, uh, verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on the wings of eagles, or the wing on the eagles' wings. And brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that I speak to the people of Israel. So, that's pretty huge. Think about what God has done here for them. He said, you are my treasure possession. Kingdom of priests. Not, not just a couple, but the, a kingdom of priests. That's pretty huge. I knew that there was a certain tribe and within that tribe, there was a certain group of folks that were called out to be priests, and they had to be at least 30 years old, and they served for like 20 years. And, but the whole kingdom, each person could represent God as a priest, a holy nation. Uh, what he's telling them is this is your new identity. And really, that is a huge moment for them. It reminds me, uh, earlier uh, in the year, we did a series teaching on Ephesians, and Paul told a group of Gentiles, don't act like Gentiles. <laughs> and that's all they knew, because that's what they were, right? So now you've got people that have been in generational slavery called out and given a new identity as a treasured people, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. That is incredible. They are shifting out of their past of slavery into a new covenant lifestyle. Dr. Carmen Imes said this in her uh, uh, classes she did on the Exodus. It's not just who you are in a static sense. It's what you will do. They are being invited into a different way of being in the world, a different task to accomplish. And, and really, that, that is, it's mind-blowing. You were this, now you're going to be this. <laughs> and they have to learn what that means. They have to discover that, explore that, experience that. And really, up till now, there was like, I guess, two ways of looking at things. Uh, they were taken out of Egypt, and they were faced with some challenges and all this other stuff. And, and uh, the uh, carnal uh, slave mentality, if you would, is uh, you brought us into the desert to die. <laughs> Every time there was a challenge, you know, they're like, oh, okay. I mean, because they're used to looking at a God-man king, the Pharaoh, 
and they could perceive him on a horizontal level and what he said happened and blah, blah, blah. Now they're out there and they have to totally rely on God and God comes through in incredibly miraculous ways that they are not able to comprehend. So every time they're challenged, like, this is it. I mean, it has been a good ride till now, but we're, we're going to check out here in the desert. You know what I mean? Could we just die back in Egypt? You know, they had graves there too. But there's another way of looking at things. The covenant mentality, which would be, we have been born here on the wings of eagles to become God's chosen people, a treasured possession. Man, just think about what all God had done up till now to bring them to this point. And where they're at, they find themselves at the base of a mountain. They find them at uh, the base of Mount Sinai. So with this particular scenario with these people and their it's hard to wrap your mind around it because we don't we weren't there you know and, and you know we're exposed to a lot of different things in media and everything and you can imagine things and something super happens and you're like hmm, meh <laughs> that experience was mid you know I don't know but for them I mean this is super califrigic aspidocious you know what I mean it's beyond words it's beyond wonderful what they've experienced here you know so, um, as mentioned earlier, the whole thing with the Gentile conversion, uh, they had to look back to this event, look back to Exodus, look back to the Old Testament to see what their identity would be. Here, these people are getting a whole brand new identity, and it's going to be communicated to them by God himself and through Moses' ministry. But let's also think about their previous environment. You know, where were these people at? Um, I, I, for me personally, I can't even imagine what it would be to be the progeny of generational slavery. What, what would it have been to grow up in that environment and seeing what your grandfather and your great-grandfather or great-grandma or whatever experienced and what you are living, that is your reality. It's all you know. That is your perspective of the world. What I do understand from a experiential point of view is uh, what it is to live as a person that is never good enough. I can empathize with that. Whether it was from external pressure or internal pressures, the trauma that that brings to a person's life of never measuring up, never being as good as so-and-so or any of those things. This is something that they would have lived every day. Imagine being one of Jacob's offspring and serving the Egyptians, always being a second-hand citizen never as good as the people that lived in the native land. Thoughts and feelings of inferiority. Living a life being reactive to negative stimulation. That's all you got. Consequence, not reward. So, here they're dealing with always being second best. Thoughts of inferiority cruel treatment, hard labor, and your children facing genocide, whether they were killed by the midwives or chucked in the Nile or whatever. What duress would they have been under every day, fearing for their lives, never enjoying freedom? It makes me ask the question, if you were not in that situation, what kind of self-preservation behaviors and emotions would you or I have or would I exhibit when challenged with what seems to be life or death? You know, they have this, uh, today we understand Stockholm Syndrome, where people become empathetic of their captors' causes and they don't want to be rescued. Would the children of Israel 
been in that situation, would it not better for us to stay there than come out here to die in the desert? So I really don't feel too critical of those when they came up. I mean, yes, they saw these great things and they went through the 10 plagues and, you know, they got out and they went through the Reed Sea and all this stuff is magnificently awesome that you can't even explain. But really, where were their heads? Talking about generations of people living in this kind of challenging scenario. It would have taken a person outside of this system to lead them out. Enter Moses. Raised in Pharaoh's courts. Treated like Pharaoh's son. This man had the ability to say no. Can you imagine the life of never being able to say no? We want you to move all these blocks from here to there in the rain with just your back. No, no, I ain't doing that. (laughs) Consequence, right? They don't have the ability to say no. Uh, Conditions are kind of rough today, and we don't have enough water for the... No, sorry. You're going to work, whatever it is. They don't have the ability to say no. But Moses was a different individual. And it took his leadership and God being able to work within this man. And even when he was up on the mountain, he almost said no, didn't he? (laughs) Isn't there somebody else that can do this? You sure it's me? Man, I don't even remember the language. I got your brother. God, did he work with him in so many different ways? But he did it, right? And this whole thing started on Sinai. Now they find themselves full circle back at the base of this mountain. Now God is going to appear before them and speak to them. Does that sound, does that not sound pretty amazing? Uh, uh, When I think about this, you have a God that is everywhere present. And he's in, you know, a lot of things. And even if you had eyeball, and I had eyeballs that wrapped all the way around our head, right? And a stripe of them across the top of our head, right? Maybe some in our feet so we can look down. I mean, you're, you're looking in a lot of different ways, right? You still can't take in how great and how vast God is. Can you see the universe from the backside or from one side or the other? Can you and I, standing on this planet, Look at the back side of the moon. I could know. God is everywhere and he fills all things. He's all in all. All of a sudden, this God that is so vast, is so great, that is so incredible, is going to come into some kind of smaller form to meet his people and talk to them. Is that not incredible? I mean, that blows your mind. I mean, when I think about it, it makes me feel emotional about that, thinking about a God coming down to talk to a people. That's huge. Would they have been able to tolerate that? To take that? We'll we'll find out. (laughs) We're going to get to that, what they thought about that. So... He is going to produce a visible manifestation of his presence. So let's look at uh, Exodus uh, 19 and 7. And Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that God had commanded him. And all the people answered and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Wow. That blows my mind too. They were just under servitude to something else. And then they've got this calling, this message that comes to them. And they're ready to say, man, I'm in. I'll do it. Let's do this thing. Let's let's meet this God. Let's see what he's got to say. So then Moses told them to get ready to consecrate themselves, to wash up clean their clothes, 
you know, and be ready on the third day. Don't mess around with your woman. I mean, we want you guys, you know, ready to meet your God and be focused on that. Don't get distracted with anything else. And on that third day, God shows out in an amazing fashion. There's a cloud around this mountain. There's lightning and thunderings and blowing of trumpets, and it's just such a magnificent display. I mean, if you think about taking the entire uh, expanse of what God is and bringing it down into a smaller portion that man can see, the smallest it could be was a volcano. Oh, my God. It was so magnificent that the people said, don't ever do that again. Oh, my God. They said, look, Moses, I don't know if we can take this stuff. I mean, that was pretty amazing. And they were warned, look, don't break through the cloud because, because it's so awesome. We don't want people to die. That's how magnificent this display was. It was so uh, challenging to their senses. They said, Moses, <laughs> you go talk to him, and then you come tell us what he said. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how amazing this manifestation of God was. You could only, I mean, I think about when I was talking to my wife about it, because I didn't grow up in a slave environment, I didn't grow up in these different things, and and, and I'm an energetic person. I mean, I'd be tempted. I'd want to, like, run through that cloud and go up there and see this God that did all this cool stuff and say, thanks, man, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore in Egypt. You know, but I, I, I didn't live there. I wasn't there, and I wasn't exposed to TV. I mean, they weren't exposed to TV and all the other things that may have desensitized me, but I feel like, man, I would want to be one of the guys that got to go see God. But this manifestation of him on this mountain was enough to keep people back and not want to go up there. Man. I also mentioned that there was trumpets there. Uh, it'd be interesting to think about... Uh, uh, if you were to do a study on trumpets where God is present, it really bless you if you guys check that out. It's a great study. So this manifestation of God was so powerful that God told Moses to tell the people to stay at the foot of the mountain and not break through the cloud, or it could be fatal. Man, what a powerful display of God. So it's interesting, all these things that lead up to this, and it leads up to a covenant. And this covenant has laws in it. And before, you know, uh, when I would read uh, the Bible, you know, uh, you get to the laws, and you're like, man, there's a lot of rules to follow here, you know? <laughs> and uh, these people have a lot of things to think about and to put on in their mind. But the people's reception of this is a lot different than what people's reception of it is now. Uh, here's the key point to keep in mind about the law. God provided salvation for Israel before there was a law. <laughs> before there was a law, he told them, you are my treasure possession. You will be a kingdom of priests. You are a holy nation. A people that just got called out of a terrible situation and they've been elevated and called and now they're going to be commissioned to do something super excellent. But God rescued them. He didn't say, look here, uh, if you guys keep all these commandments and stuff, I'll bail you out of Egypt. Right? <laughs> it reminds me about Abraham. Abraham was counted as righteous before he was circumcised. So it's interesting how God looks upon a person's heart and he sees what is for them in the future and calls them knowing that there's going to be something great for them. And it's interesting about that. Abraham was considered righteous before he was circumcised. And then he went through the circumcision. And after that, he had 
uh, what became the nation of Israel and God's chosen people and then on the line of Messiah. Abraham can be a father to the uncircumcision because he was counted righteous before he was circumcised and a father to the circumcision. That's how all of us are connected to our spiritual forefather, Abraham, and access to what God did here in the Exodus and the laws that he laid out for them. So God calls first, then he commissions. God's grace, mercy, and love is what should invoke our gratitude to serve in love. And love is a very powerful motivator. Uh, my wife and I, we like to watch this cop show, Chicago PD, you know, and it's, they got a lot of different episodes and everything. There's this one episode where bad guy A is, you know, getting ready to go to jail and he's in court and, you know, they're trying to do stuff. And then uh, bad guy B, uh, his uh, buddy or whatever, kidnaps the wife of one of the jurors and um, is going to hold that dude under duress to make him, you know, throw the trial. So uh, in the process of this, the, the main cop, he observes this juror acting funny. He gets involved. He figures it out. So then the whole team works together to try to find this person. And they narrow it down that this bad guy, B, knows something about where this woman is. So they bring him in. And, man, they threaten him up inside, one down, and, you know, all these, you know, jury tampering and kidnapping and blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And that dude's like, Pfft. You know, everything you're saying is, you know, hearsay or circumstantial. You, got, you have no proof that why she'd be putting me in jail, you know. I ain't got nothing to say to you. We don't talk to police. He says, okay. So he keeps on digging, and they find this place this guy goes to. They go there. They find this other. They go inside the house. They're looking all around. And all they find is some dude in medical clothing has no hair, no eyebrows. He's got a port in his chest. Who are you? He tells him his name. Do you know this guy? He says, That's my brother. So the guy that they're trying to figure out, you know, that did the kidnapping, it's just his brother. Meanwhile, they find a bunch of drugs in his house. And then they arrest the guy in the medical clothes, and they take the drugs and they walk them past Mr. Smugosaurus. And when he sees his brother, and they dump out the bag of stuff, he says, hey, he's nothing to do with that. He it was in his house, he was there, he's going to jail for 90 years. And you know what the healthcare system is in the prison. So the dude, all of a sudden, he's like, this is his brother. He has love for him. He's been trying to care for him. He didn't know that that stuff was in there. He's like, okay. He told him what he needed to do, and they rescued the girl, and the other dude ended up going to jail, blah, blah, blah. The point is, all that fear that they levered against that guy didn't shake him. That guy was motivated by love for his brother, and then that's how he turned out. It's interesting how powerful love is as a motivator. Our love for God is our great motivation to serve and to keep His commandments. So God set us free, and our logical response is to serve Him in love. You see, we live the way God asks us to in appreciation for all that He has done for us. This lifestyle, in turn, becomes a light to the nations. This is how we become a kingdom of priests. That's how they became a kingdom. The way they lived was so observable by others that it should have been attracting other people to God the Father. Israel, as God's treasure people, metaphorically become a covenant partner with special responsibility to represent the sovereign. That's a big deal. So they saw this law as something good. These laws and commandments that were brought out, they loved that because God actually told them these laws, how to live. It made them, uh, Moses said, 
just look at the wisdom other nations are going to look at us because we have these set of laws that our God actually came into congregation and told us these things, these great ways to live and laid down this awesome law. No other God did that. You ever hear them called dumb idols? They worship because they don't speak. Here, a God loves his people so much that he comes into concretion and talks to them and lays out this set of laws that makes them look like this incredible nation full of wisdom and the people conduct themselves. And the point of this law is love. Love. Live love and you show God. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> but, but Israel didn't always live that way, did they? <laughs> so let's take a look at uh, Malachi. Uh, it's the last book in our English Bibles. Last book of the Old Testament in our English Bibles. Malachi 3, 16 through 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared or respected the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my, what? Treasure. Treasured possession. I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more ye shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and the ones and one who does not serve him. So here the treasure possession is who? It's the ones who serve and remember the commandments. So they are not defined by ethnicity but by what they're doing. Those that keep the covenant. We'll see Peter allude to this and point all of Christendom back to this in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 9, you are a chosen race. Is this familiar language of what we covered this morning, right? You are a chosen race. The audience here is mixed. It's not just Judeans. He's talking to Gentiles too. That's pretty cool to be in this inclusive crowd right here. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That own possession is treasure possession <laughs> that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light once you were not a people and that's referring back to Hosea he had uh, some sons and one of them he named not a people it's pretty interesting but God changed that kid's name to a people that was us we were not a people now we we're included in this. You were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Praise God. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we have received that. We are included in this group. This is the fulfillment of Malachi 3.16-18. through 18. If God can for forgive an apostate Israel and bless them, and forgive them when they are trying to get back to a covenant relationship, what about people who never were in a covenant relationship, who knew nothing about the covenant? God can bless all of us too, <laughs> and he does. So Peter is turning our attention to the original covenant, and he's saying, learn from this live and be free. Originally, Israel did not see the law as a bummer. 
but as an awesome testimony of his love. How cool was it that God had that, how cool was it that they had a God that would talk to them and tell them what was expected? Now, obviously, it didn't take long for Israel to lose the understanding that the law was their mission, not their identity. The mission, not identity. What is their identity? A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? That was their identity. Their mission was the law, to be a light unto the nations. The law became an end in itself. It was such a distinguishing thing that Paul brings this up in his letter to the Corinthians to tell them, hey, that's not the point of the law. Love is the point of the law. <laughs> so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where we'll close today. Second Corinthians 3, and we'll read verses 2 and 3. You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And, and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not where? On tablets, on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of of human hearts. It was always God's intention to write upon the fleshy tables of a man's heart and not for man to get focused on what he saw and try to establish his own righteousness. They were already good enough before the law was written. He called them before there was a law. He loved them before there was a law. It's interesting when the first commandments is, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and it tells them not to make idols. Why? Think about that. God is everywhere and he's in everything. Yes, God is in the trees. Don't want you to work the tree. No, you're putting me in a box. <laughs> is God in, in nature? Yes, but don't worship it. Is he in the stars? Yes, but don't worship that. Focus on the God that will be I am. That'll be whatever I, you need me to be, I'll be that. If you need me to be a pillar of fire at night, I'll be that. If you need to be a cloud by day, I'll be, you need water out of a rock, I'll be that. You need manna from heaven, you need meat. You need healing. <laughs> whatever you need, God is that. He's telling these people he's called them out of this terrible situation. Maybe you and I have, may have had some things in our background that we want to separate ourselves. God called us out of that. And he's commissioned us by love to live for him. And as you and I live these things that the word asks us to do, a new command like you, that you love one another, by this shall you know that you're the children of God. If you love one another, if we live love, we are that nation of priests. We are God's chosen people. We are God's treasure. We are a holy nation. And our light radiates and shines to our communities. And they can say, I want that. I want to be a part of that. I want a God like that for myself. Heavenly Father, we sure love you and are so grateful for the ways that you have manifested yourself to man, whether it's by a tremendous volcanic eruption that blows people's minds, or if it's in the little things of life. We are so thankful for how you've called us by way of your Son, Jesus Christ, and provided an exodus for us out of the past and into a glorious future with you forevermore. 
Thank you for just how you are there for us and that you will be whatever you need us to be and how we can have the courage to live as men and women for you in this day and time because your love is so tremendous that it exceeds all of our flaws and all of our sins and all of the stuff that holds us back. But you love us with all that you are and you've provided for us by way of Jesus Christ to live a life of freedom and peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.